everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Beyond the Q. Today, I am very excited to welcome Neil Smith. He is the Senior Director of Support at Iterable. Thanks for being here, Neil. Thanks for having me, Meredith. I'm so excited to talk to you. Yeah, I think we've got a really good topic today. Um, something I know that every support leader deals with, um, and that is specifically how to set up an effective and efficient interviewing process. So I've, you know, I've talked with a ton of support leaders who need to hire a lot of amazing people and they need to do it quickly um, so they can keep up with their company's growth trajectory. So in order to do that at scale, uh, you need a really solid interview process. Um, again, it has to be efficient, has to be structured in a way that allows hiring managers to like really gauge the candidate's skills, their experience, culture fit, all of that. Um, and perhaps most importantly, it should provide a positive experience for the candidate. So, Neil, I know you have thought through all of this a lot, um, and I've heard that you have established a really successful interview process over there at Iterable. So I am excited to pick your brain. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, well, first, a little bit of context. You know, Iterable, we're um, a customer engagement platform, have been in business for eight years at this point. Uh, so we're really focused on allowing our customers to provide personalized uh, communications, moving away from this old kind of batch and blast approach um, that, that our customers have used in the past. Uh, and especially since the pandemic, the focus on that level of personalization is really important. So that's what our platform does. It allows our customers to do that using our various different kind of workflows that you can generate uh, across multiple different kinds of channels. So email and SMS and push notifications. And so we have customers like DoorDash and Box.com and Fender Musical Instruments and um, uh, Zillow, uh, all using the Iterable platform to engage their customers. And it's growing very, very fast. So I, I think when I started nearly four years ago at this point, we had something like 100 people. My team was just three people. Now we have more than 600 employees. My team has grown wow. to nearly 30. Uh, a couple of months ago, we were super excited to announce that we'd passed $100 million of annual recurring revenue. Uh, so when you're growing at that level of scale, um, it, it's really important to get that interview process really buttoned up. So one of the first things that we did is we we decided that, that we were going to start taking it out of the hands of the recruiting team, not because we didn't trust them. It's quite the opposite. They do such a tremendous job. Um, but we typically hire the same position over and over and over again. So our, I, I'd call it, I guess it's an entry level role, but, but we're hiring people who are really very skilled. Uh, but it's the same, the same position we're always hiring. Um, we've never really had to hire any of the senior roles externally because we focus very much on growing our team members' careers from within the organization. And so we like to promote into any senior roles on the team. So when you do the same thing over and over again, you kind of get quite good at it or quite used to it. And it means you can take it out of the hands of the recruiting team. We don't need them to be on phone screens all the time. We don't need them to do all that first stuff. So all of our hiring managers, they will always review every single application that comes in. They will be the ones that then do that initial phone screen. And, and that phone screen, it's just half an hour long. They don't go very deep. We're just getting a feel for the candidate's experience, what their communication skills are like, if they have any applied technical knowledge, where they live, and, and, and that kind of stuff. One thing we do get into a little bit, though, is company culture. We want to start that conversation about their values and what's important to them. Then the next step, if they pass through the phone screen, is we do the on-site or it's a virtual on-site right now, of course, with the uh, with the pandemic. And in fact, 60% of the folks on our team have been hired since the pandemic began. Um, and uh, they call themselves the COVID crew. They, they have their own Slack channel and everything. It's pretty awesome. Um, so with the panel, they meet four people, all from the customer success org. Um, but we try and focus on providing them a panel with fairly diverse backgrounds. So they're going to meet someone who would be their peer, they're going to meet a customer success manager. They're going to meet a manager from my team. And then for now, I interview all of those candidates as well. As we scale, I'm sure I'm going to have to kind of back away from that a little bit. Um, but up until now, I've, I've interviewed everybody. 
And so each interviewer is given one of our four core values to probe on and three to four different competencies. And so our four core values, uh, growth mindset, trust, balance, and humility. And we really focus very much on values, both as, a, as an org just day to day, but we bring it into the, the hiring process. And that's not just my team, that's across the company. So each one of those team members uh, on the panel, they've got one value, and then we give them a, a number of competencies to probe on. And we also provide them with sample questions. Uh, the, the reality is we've only got a couple of hours with this candidate, so each each minute is, is gold, it's valuable. Um, and so we don't want to waste time. We don't want to have interviewers asking the same questions over and over again, um, partly because it's kind of an, uh, not a great experience for the candidate as well. You, you don't want to have to say the same things multiple times. Um, so I'm, I'm always pushing my team to utilize behavioral questions, very much the tell me about a time when you, those kinds of questions. Um, because the way I see these interviews is the goal is to gather evidence of whether the candidate has the values and competency alignment. That's really all we're doing, gathering that evidence. And the best way to do that is to have them talk about how they've done that in the past, how they've lived those values or exposed those values uh, and those competencies in the past. So I use a, a model that I call PARLO, which is um, problem, action, result, learning, and application. There's a bunch of other different models out there, I think, that, that are fairly similar. But, but basically, uh, what happened? What did you do? What was the end result? What did you learn from it? Have you been able to apply it since then? Um, so everybody on my team who participates in interviews, I run through a training explaining all this to them so that they feel fully empowered to have a successful interview. So that's the panel. And then the final step is a tech challenge. So what we do is we give them a technical topic 48 hours before the interview. And then we ask them to go away and learn about it and prepare a presentation for us. And we tell them, present as if you're presenting to a non-technical audience, uh, like a person in the street. And then following that you know, 15, 20 minute presentation, they're gonna get Q&A from the team. So we usually have five, six team members in, in this presentation. And they'll ask much deeper technical questions. Um, and the, the, we can establish so much from uh, a presentation like this. Do they have good verbal and written communication skills? Are they able to kind of connect the dots around different technical and deep technical concepts? Um, can they talk to both technical and non-technical audiences? Um, it's, it's so revealing. It's such a, a great process. We love it. Um, and we've actually had really promising candidates come into this and then really fall down in the presentation. And following that, we've said, you know, we wish you well. This is when we're not going to proceed. Um, and then conversely, we've also had candidates come into the tech presentation that we're like, we think they might be a good candidate. Let's run them through the tech presentation and see. And then they just knocked it out of the park and we've hired them pretty much on the spot. So that's a... Uh, that's kind of the overview of the structure. It's very fast, really, you know, a half hour phone screen, two hour panel and a half hour presentation. And after that, we should be fully equipped to be able to make a decision. Okay. So just to clarify that. So you said half hour phone screen, two hour panel, and then how mm -hmm. long for the tech challenge? It's uh, 30 minutes. Yeah. 30 minutes. Okay. That's really interesting, especially the tech challenge part. Um, I'm curious what, what made you want to add that to your process and have you done that before or was iterable the first time you you tried I, that i actually brought that in at my last company um it was I, i'm not quite sure why i did that um i think we did want to establish whether they both had the technical competencies that we were looking for but also, can they think on the fly? Can they uh, communicate remotely? Like at that company, obviously, we were in the office. It was pre-pandemic. But we realized that most of the communications that the support team members were having with customers obviously were not in person. They were either over the phone or through live chat or something like that. And so for the tech challenge there, we specifically said, this is going to be a remote presentation. You are not coming into the office for this. Um, 
to simulate that kind of environment that that they would have in their day to day. And so it seemed to work pretty well. And so that's why I implemented it here at Iterable as well. Okay, cool. Yeah, well, thank you for kind of giving me that that overview. Um, so I'm curious, why why do you like to structure it that way with that the screening, the panel, and then the tech challenge? Yeah, there's there's a number of reasons. I, I alluded to one of them earlier, which is which is to take the load off recruiting. Uh, the reality is, like our our recruiting team, they're having to hire so many positions. And a lot of them are kind of niche or one-off or the first time they've hired for a position like that or more senior positions, therefore really difficult to fill. So whatever we can do to empower their success by allowing them to focus on those, you know, we, we want to do that. We've used the same approach over and over. We're familiar with it and, and we can do most of it ourselves. The second is that it's really fast, you know, that that 30 minute call, two hour panel, 30 minute presentation. We're not asking much from the candidate um, because each step we've made sure that we've optimized it to get the most out of it. Um, yeah, as, as, as they move through this, we, we walk away from each step with the maximum amount of information that we can get from, uh, from, that, that, from that step. Um, and then the third thing with the structure is it really allows us to probe on both competencies and, and values. So I, I think a lot of people, when they go into interviews, they're using it to gauge a candidate's experience. We try and do it to gauge a candidate's values alignment first. That's the most important thing for us. Competency alignment is second. And for, for me, and I think for a lot of people at Iterable, experience is third. Um, especially with support roles. And I, I've listened to a couple of the other interviews that you've done with your guests, and it seems to be a little bit of a theme with, with some of them is that the reality is like a support role, applied role specific experience doesn't necessarily seem to be a strong indicator of future success. We can make them successful if they don't have a bachelor's degree or if they haven't worked support before. Like I've got uh, one person on my team was a, pediatric speech therapist and then she went and did a, a coding boot camp and um she's she's been tremendously successful so, someone else um came from uh, an entirely different background very academic kind of background but had done a lot of work with um r the the statistics coding language in college and and that's a really difficult language to work with and when i saw that on her resume i was like oh that's interesting. I like the look of that. And we talked to her and she just did awesome in the process. And since then she's, um, she's now in one of the senior roles on our team. Um, the, the thing is, if they're not aligned with our values, I don't see there's anything that we can really do with them. I, I'm one of my, uh, side interests is, is motorsports and uh, car racing. And there's this, a saying there that it's, it's easier to make a fast car reliable than a reliable car fast. And I kind of think about it the same way with, with hiring. It's easier to take someone who's values aligned and build their experience than to take someone who has great experience but doesn't align with your values. Like you, It's very difficult to change someone's values. Yeah, yeah, that's a really great point. Sometimes I wonder if there's so much focus on experience and in job interviews because it's, I don't wanna say easier to gauge, but in some ways it is. It's more of like a hard skill, like there's, there's clear evidence. Whereas with values and competencies, you really have to, you got to dig in there a little bit. You do. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I'm curious, especially in the phone screening, like how do you kind of get a feel for whether there'll be a value fit um, just in those short 30 minutes? In the phone screen, it's a little bit less on the, the values piece. We do ask a question in there about, you know, what is important to you and your next company in terms of culture and values. Um, so that gives us a little bit of an indication. To be honest, we focus the panel really on establishing the, the values alignment and and, uh, and the competency alignment. So, um, you know, the, the kinds of questions that we ask uh, are really through the lens of, you know, give us an example of a time where uh, you were dealing with a really angry customer. You know, that 
that gets to the competency of humility, uh, gets to um, uh, the competency of, of staying calm under pressure. Um, you know, every single question that we ask is there because it is probing for a, a, a value or, or a competency. Mm. So in addition to that question, what are some of the other tell me about a time when type of oh, questions yeah. you've asked? Yeah. Um, so something like, tell me about a time where you had to very quickly learn a new technology. That's a, that's a really good one for figuring out, are they a fast learner? Are they technical? Um, are they intellectually curious? You know, uh, something like that is, is really interesting. One of the competence or one of the values that I uh, probe on in my interviews is the value of trust. And there's, there's a really, it, it's a, it's not an easy question because not everybody actually has an example of this. And so if they don't, then we have to use a hypothetical, but if they do, it's, it's really interesting. Tell me about a time where you are asked to do something by someone in a position of seniority that you felt was not in the best interest of the customer. Mm. Yeah. That's always, that's always <laughs> interesting to see what kind of answers you get. Yeah. Both in how they handle the, the senior person and also the customer. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Very cool. Um, so you you mentioned that the second part of the process, this panel interview, you bring in, um, I don't remember how many people you said you bring in. Four. Four. Four people. And yep. each of them is assigned one core value and then three to four competencies. Yeah. Um, so what's, yeah, what's kind of your reasoning for that and bringing in, you know, multiple people, each of them having their own responsibilities, looking for different things? Well, um, it, it, it's a heavy workload to try and really establish if somebody is going to be a good fit for the role. And so just from a logical perspective, you want to divide it up. Like you don't want people overlapping with each other. Uh, so it makes sense to kind of keep everybody really focused on a, a small set of, of competencies. Um, and I, I have a big list of all the potential competencies that are out there and then I've used that list to kind of narrow down on which are the ones that are really important to this particular role, the, the technical support specialist role that, that we are usually hiring for. And other roles within the org might have different competencies which are important. Um, and it's up to those hiring managers to figure out how they're going to probe for those. Um, but I think most support leaders would probably coalesce around a few things that are really important, like obviously communication skills, uh, uh, time management, staying organized, uh, staying staying calm, um, but also uh, uh, wanting to be a, a constantly learning, constantly growing. Um, so that intellectual curiosity piece that I mentioned a little bit earlier is absolutely vital for us. Um, so when we distill it down, we find like what are the 12 top competencies? And I can't remember all 12 off the top of my head, but um, you know, uh, flexibility, motivation, those are a couple of others that, that are important. Analytical is another, um, let's see. Yeah, I can't, I can't remember the, the rest of them off the top of my head, but uh, yeah, we focus on those 12 and, uh, and divide them up. Okay. And then remind me, what are the four values that are split amongst these folks? Uh, trust, humility, uh, balance and growth mindset. Mm, okay. I suppose doing it this way with this panel interview is also a good way to reinforce those values consistently with other members of the team. Yes, that is true. I, I will say though that Iterable does such a tremendous job of really keeping values front and center that we we don't necessarily need to be reminded what our values are. Like every Thursday we have a, a all hands town hall and one of the first slides that's always put up is, you know, our four core values along with our, our current uh, mission statement as well. So, um, yeah, it's it's really front and center with us. Awesome. I love that. Yeah. Um, so earlier you were talking about how one reason you've, you've set up your interview structure this way is because it provides a more positive candidate experience. Um, so can you just share with me in your mind, what makes a positive candidate experience and then how you, you know, kept that in the front of your mind as you structured this interview process and how it provides a positive candidate experience. Yeah, it's so important. Um, the, the first thing I would say is 
it seems really obvious, but be respectful of the candidates, be respectful of their time, be respectful of their background, be respectful of any personal challenges they have. Uh, I, I remember one interview that I had with a candidate. He was he was great, really nice guy. But in the middle, he started to appear like super distracted. And I thought, oh, my goodness, what's going on? Is everything OK? And it turned out that his kid was sick, was like actually literally being sick in the next room. Oh, no. Um, and, and oh, my God, I felt so bad for him. I'm a parent. We have three members on our team who are currently out on paternity leave right now. So we're going to have three new parents on the team. And, and there's four others who are also parents. Um, and, uh, you know, balance is one of our core values and having that balance between work and home is super important. So, you know, we made sure that he felt he could go take care of, of his kid and that there'd be no penalty on this. Like, let's just reschedule. I'm, we're not going to we're not going to penalize you for this. Um, it, it's important to us to communicate that to them. Um, you know, I, Another way of being respectful is to not have them repeat themselves. That's why dividing up those interview questions is so important. Um, it, and it also demonstrates to them that, that you as a company, you've got, you've got everything buttoned up really nicely. You know, it's, it, it's clear that, that you're organized and, and um, if you're organized in the interview process, then hopefully it indicates that you're organized in all other parts of your business too. The, the second thing, I think is it's so important to be human in panel interviews in particular. Um, I, I mentioned the training that I do for all of my team members who do interview. One of the things I say in there is the very first thing you do when you speak to the candidate is you just check in with them. Do you need a couple of moments for a bio break? Do you need to go get water? Um, in, in particularly in these remote interviews where you're on Zooms, it can be it can be a, a real situation. The candidate will could feel like they can't step away to go use the bathroom or go get some water. So just a touch like that, I think, really helps humanize the whole experience. Uh, introduce yourself. Make sure that they know who you are. They're about to reveal a whole bunch about themselves. The least you can do is reveal a little bit about yourself as well. Um, and just try and take a little bit of that nervousness that is always evident. Take that out of the out of the room. Also try and take out any power dynamics that are in there. The reality is like an interview is a weird power dynamic. Like I have a job, you want the job, I can give it to you. That's, there's, there's a, there is a power dynamic there and whatever you can do to take that down is, is really important, especially when you're hiring for junior roles. And especially when you're in a situation where you have a male interviewer who's in a position of seniority, who's interviewing a female identifying candidate, um, that's especially important. You know, if, if it's a, a junior, you know, younger female identifying candidate speaking to an older senior male interviewer, I'm conscious of the fact like, okay, I'm 45. I have se a senior director in my title. You're a candidate who's female identifying your maybe 23. You haven't been out of college very long. Like there's a huge power dynamic there. Whatever I can do to kind of remove that and humanize the situation is so, so important. Um, one thing that I really don't do is ask about the candidate's personal life. So hu humanizing the situation is very important, but the one hack that I don't use to do that is to talk about the candidate's personal life. So I train the team, like no questions on hobbies, no questions really even about how was your weekend. Um, that there's other ways to connect on a human level and their personal life is basically irrelevant to the role. Yes, there's maybe things that they do in their personal life that could indicate that they have the competencies, but let's get that from questions about their professional experience, not through other questions. I mean, if if they reveal something that's related to one of the protected classes, such as their family situation or their religion or something like that, you're getting into really potentially awkward territory. You know, if you have to reject a candidate, you never want to have them even have the slightest thought that the rejection is due to something that they've talked about that was related to a protected class. But the moment you sign that, that, that offer letter, then I want to know all about your personal life. Like, right. tell me what you do. <laughs> what, what are your interests? I want to know you as a person after that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it sounds like it's kind of a mix between both the logistical side of things, you know, scheduling efficient, interview processes with that phone screening, with the panel interview, with the tech challenge, so that it's, 
the candidates know exactly how much time it will take for each step of the way. Yeah. Um, but then also kind of the human side of it, you know, making sure yeah. that the candidate feels respected, um, that the team knows what's expected of them. Um, yeah. Yeah. And exactly. I, I'm curious to learn a little bit more about this training you said you do. So before, so before interviews, you said that you, or maybe it's just kind of a regular thing, but you train your team on how to be, be great interviewers. Yeah. So I'm curious what you kind of go over with them. It's, it's really pretty lightweight. Um, I know that our learning and development team is that they have a training that, that they've used in the past and I think is currently being revamped and is going to be rolled out to the company as a whole. And once that's in place, great, I'm going to let them take care of it. But, um, but in the meantime, it's literally just half an hour. And, and I know that many of the people on my team are earlier in their careers, maybe not as familiar with the, the process of interviewing. And so it's, I think it's important to just add one more competency to, to, um, to the, the list of skills that they have that, the experience that they have. Uh, and a lot of what we're talking about right now is really what I cover in the training, you know, the, the, how the interview is structured, the goals of the interview, how we ask the questions and, um, you know, then those, the, the legal gotchas, the stay away from the personal questions. Um, so it's, it's really pretty straightforward and pretty lightweight and it literally only takes half an hour. Oh, nice. Okay. Keeping up with that efficiency theme. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Um, so I kind of want to back up a little bit for a second, um, with the tech challenge. So that third part of your process, what are some of the scenarios you're giving these candidates, um, to research and present? Oh, that's, that's a fun question. (laughs) Um, because I'm not going to tell you. Okay. Um, Don't want to reveal the secret sauce. <laughs> part, yeah, but part, part of it is, um, I, I can give you a high level, of course. Um, part of it is that we want to make sure that the candidate has not been exposed to the technology that they're going to be presenting on. And we have actually had a couple of candidates in the past where, you know, the, the technology that we normally use, we can't use. We have to switch to a different one because they have experience with it in the past. Um but, but generally speaking, we're going to ask them to present on a, uh, a platform or a, or a technology that we use actually within our own infrastructure. So we as a team are relatively familiar with how it works, what it does, uh, uh, the history of that platform, um, the challenges of using it, the benefits of using it. Um, and, uh, and so we're in a good position to be able to ask good questions. Um, and, and evaluate whether their presentation is is really on point or not. So, yeah, that's 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 usually what we end up doing. Um, we take that that one of those core pieces of our infrastructure, and we ask them about that. Okay, and they have to talk about how to use it. Um, mm-hmm. is, it is that generally so, it? Yeah, we give them a, a, a little bit of a. a direction you know you may want to talk about uh the history of the platform um how it works the benefits um when you would use it when you wouldn't use it um how it compares to other uh, other similar kinds of platforms and you know um maybe some use cases uh in the real world okay that's really cool (laughs) yeah i can see it's fun (laughs) Yeah, I can see how that's a great way to evaluate a candidate's ability to learn something new. I know that's one of the values, um, to communicate well, to answer questions on the fly. Yeah, exactly. Very cool. Okay, um, so now I kind of want to go back to the more like human side of your interview process. I, yeah. I know that you have mentioned before that diversity and in- inclusion is a big value for you and your team. So what specific things are you doing in your interview process to make sure that it is more inclusive? Yeah, you're right. We really do value this very, very highly. Um, the first thing that we did around ensuring that, that we could drive towards a team that more accurately represented the diversity of our community uh, is to overhaul our job descriptions. There's so much bias built into most job descriptions, um, things like requirements that are kind of super exclusionary or 
unnecessarily aggressive language. Like I've seen job descriptions where uh, it, it says something like, we're looking for someone who can crush it. I mean, so aggressive and just totally inappropriate because that that immediately kind of can put off a, a, a large cohort of potential candidates. And again, job descriptions focus generally a lot on experience and we've discovered that experience is not necessarily a success factor, um, especially with support. Um, people from all kinds of backgrounds can thrive in a support role. The question really is, are you smart? Are you personable? Like really those are kind of the two buckets of, of, of competencies and values that are important to us. If you are, you, you're probably a good fit. And just because you don't have a bachelor's degree or maybe you haven't worked in support before, doesn't mean you're not smart or you're not personable. So we went through our job descriptions, you know, with the proverbial fine tooth comb uh, through that lens of diversity. And we really focused on what our, our must haves um, and make sure that they really are must haves. And so I actually wrote them down here. I looked at the job description this morning and there's only four. One is a demonstrated ability to solve technical problems. So that doesn't necessarily mean professional experience, but somehow a demonstrated ability to do that a desire to teach new customers about the platform, uh, an ability to answer product and technical questions, and passion for startups, software, and SaaS products. That's it. Everything else is a nice to have. So previous experience in a B2B tech support role at a SaaS company, experience with email, push, SMS, experience with Jira or Zendesk, familiarity with APIs, DNS, HTML, CSS, you know, all that kind of stuff. That's all just nice to haves. Um, so once we put that job description out there, yes, it meant we had a much wider pool of candidates applying. And that meant we had a larger number of applications that really were not a good fit. That's okay. That's the price that you have to pay, I think, in order to entertain a much wider pool of candidates. Um, and yeah, that's, and that's not a problem. Um, the, the second thing that we did after we went through the job description overhaul is, and this is something that as a company we've done, this is not specifically support, but being super intentional about uh, the pipeline that you have, the hiring pipeline that you have. And so our sourcing efforts have really focused on underrepresented minorities. Um, and so we'll do things like we'll go to events like Afrotech or Lesbians Who Tech, um, the Grace Hopper celebration, which is the Global Women in Tech conference. Like we've had presence at those kind of conferences and continue to do that. Um, we want to meet potentially diverse candidates at their own places. So, you know, we've attended virtual job fairs at historically black colleges and universities. Carnegie Mellon is one that comes to mind. So, um, you know, if you if you put more diversity in the top of the hiring funnel, you're going to get more diversity out of the bottom of it. Um, and then one other thing that we've really tried to do is once someone is actually in our interview panel, we want to make sure that the panel represents the diversity of our communities as well. So we're very intentional about who is on the panel. It's not just like, you know, this TSS is available on this day, so they're going to be on the panel and this CSM is available on this day, so they're going to be on it. No, no, we, we, we evaluate the combination of, uh, or the makeup of, of every single panel. Um, we want to make sure that we have representatives from different uh, locations, uh, different teams within customer success, uh, different gender identification, and different ethnicity. Um, CS within Iterable is actually a pretty diverse org already, well above our tech industry averages, and support is actually even more diverse than CS as a whole. So um, we're lucky in that we have a lot of people to choose from to really represent that level of diversity. But I think, again, going back to that candidate experience, I think it's really important for candidates to feel that that they are in a place that is welcoming of every every kind of background, every uh, experience, every different kind of experience, different ethnicity, different gender identification, all of that. I think that helps put candidates at ease. Um, and especially if you have diverse candidates, if they see people who are like them in the interview process, that gives them the idea like, oh, I could see myself here. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, I think I think that we even talked about this earlier, like a, diver a diverse team is a strong team. 
Oh, for sure. It really is. I mean, I think of the the kinds of, of insights and ideas that come from the people on, on my team who don't come from a support background um, and, and just do a lot of asking why and really important why question. Why are we doing it this way? Why is this the right approach? Like those are, those are such great questions to have. And you get so many more of that, that so many more of those kinds of questions when you have a, a rich and diverse team. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so kind of thinking it back more bigger picture here, um, as far as the overall interview process, you know, given the speed at which you need to hire to keep up with iterables, massive growth right now. Um, how does your interview structure help you balance that quantity and that quality issue? Yeah. Um, the, you're quite right. The speed at which we are growing means that we, we have to kind of crank through this stuff. And that's part of the reason that we've optimized the process as much as we, as much as we have and make it short, um, and just have those three different steps. The second thing that's been really helpful for us is if you focus on really, really strongly focus on career development and promote people from within, it means that you're not having to spread your attention on many different kinds of roles, hiring for, for senior roles, hiring for junior roles. We've been able to make it so that the only role that we need to worry about is our technical support specialist role, which is kind of our standard frontline support role. Um, and with that level of focus, it makes it a heck of a lot easier to, um, to kind of get a, a virtuous cycle going. We find ourselves very frequently with two awesome candidates at the end of a hiring cycle. And although initially we only had one headcount open, it turns out, hey, we just promoted someone else from within. And so we actually do need two people. Um, and so uh, that that happens really pretty often. We, we are hiring pairs, and which is great for the, the, the new hire because they've got, they've immediately got someone else who is experiencing exactly the same thing that they're experiencing at the same time. So, so that's been, that's been really cool. Um, and then uh, the, the other thing that allows us to move quickly is by not excluding candidates from the process, just because of a lack of experience by having that really rich pool. Um, you can, yes, you've got to look at a lot of different applications, uh, but that's not particularly time consuming. Um, if you have a lot of, of applications to choose from though, it means that you can keep the cycle constantly going. So um, it's it's worked worked pretty well for us. Like we have a lot of candidates to look at, but we have a, a, a really solid lens of how to look at them to identify who are the candidates we're really interested in. Okay. I love that concept uh, you mentioned of really focusing on promoting your internal employees to the leadership position so that all you have to really focus on for new hiring is your frontline agents. That's smart. Yeah. It's, it's great <laughs> to see so many folks on, on the team, like really building their careers uh, and, you know, doing it in front of our eyes. Uh, one of, one of the um, more senior members on my team, he started as a sales development rep um, in the very beginning. And then he, wanted to move into support. He came over, was one of the support team's earliest members. Then he became a senior support um, support person working with more of our premier customers. Then he moved into a lead role. Then he moved into a manager role. So, and now he's like, right now he has something at like 12 direct reports because we've got somebody out on paternity leave. Um, uh, but uh, it's, it's been awesome to see him grow his career. And that, you know, that's just one example. Uh, we have not had, in fact, let, let, me, let me back up. In the three and a half years that I've been with the company, we've only had one person leave the support team to go work for another company um, by, their, by their own choice. Everybody else has been promoted within or has gone to different roles within, within Iterable. Um, so we, we're trying to make it so that we are really building people's careers. And then as you say, that means I, I don't have to worry about any of these more senior roles. I've got everything I need within the team. And we have conversations like, what do you want to learn? Where do you want to go next? And let's provide them with the resources that they need to get there. Um, because then they're going to stay with us. 
they're going to get really good at their jobs. They, and that's going to provide a better customer experience. And it's all great for the success of the business. <laughs> it's a win-win all around. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, well, I think that's a nice segue to my next question. So what results have you seen from structuring your inter interview process the way that you have? Um, I alluded to it a little bit in the previous question, which is just a great, great team. Like the, the end result is you, you end up with people who are just a great fit for the role and great fit for the company. And then that gives us great CSAT. So, you know, our, our average CSAT is, is really, really high. Customers are generally very, very happy with the support that they receive from, from Iterable. Um, we've got that really high employee retention as well. Um, it, I think the one person that we've lost, it, it was just, it maybe wasn't a great fit, but everybody else, you know, the, the values alignment, the competency alignment, it makes it so that they feel very much at home uh, at, at Iterable. Um, and we have evidence of that as well through our, our uh, twice annual employee engagement survey. So our support team is scoring 94% on our engagement survey, which is very, very high. Um, and the most recent survey that we did, there was a score of 100% on the, the belonging category, which <laughs> that was, that was I, I looked at that and I'm like, oh, that's so nice. <laughs> yeah, I felt so, so good about that. Um, and, and and it doesn't just help us as a business to to get this right. It I mean it helps our employees. They they they're, they're happy. I, mm -hmm. I want everybody to be happy, really. And so, <laughs> um, you know, if if you feel like you belong at work, that really does raise your overall quality of life. Um, so, yeah, that's that's one other really great tangible result that we've seen from from getting the interview process right. Wow. Yeah, those are all amazing, especially that those high engagement scores and the high retention scores. I know that can sometimes be a challenge with support. Yeah. Yeah, it really can. Uh, I, I think I, I'm not uh, ignoring the fact that as a company, because we're growing so fast, we're able to offer all these opportunities. Like if we were not growing at this kind of pace, I I wouldn't have such frequent opportunities for promotions for the team. And then maybe you do start to get into the, the areas that some support orgs have to struggle with where people are in the same role for 18 months, two years, two and a half years, and then burnout can be, can be a problem. So I'm, I'm realistic about that. Um, we, we are lucky that we have that growth rate, and I'm sure at some point in the future, when the growth rate starts to slow down, we'll have to be a little bit more intentional about how we avoid um, people burning out. But uh, for now, the focus is more on like, how do we keep that growth going? Yeah, well, it sounds like you're off to a great start. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what advice do you have for other support leaders who want to do what you're doing, you know, build an effective, efficient and really inclusive interview process? Yeah, the first is definitely revisit your job descriptions. Um, focus on what's truly important and, and know what are the success factors for the roles that you're hiring for. So, you know, in our organization, it's a fairly technical product. There's a, a lot of depth and complexity to it. So we have to focus on bringing in people who are, are capable of, of handling that. Other support orgs maybe have a, a, a more um, transactional and so staying calm, working fast, um, taking a lot of different information, you know, those might be the success factors for those roles. But whatever those are, the support leaders need to focus on what's truly important and make sure that that's what's in the job description and pull out everything else that is not important. Um, the second thing I would say is never underestimate the value of the candidate experience. Uh, you never know, like if you reject a candidate and you do it kind of in a in a not great way or, or a very kind of um, robotic way, you never know, like you might need to come back to that candidate and reoffer them the job if your first choice ends up suddenly changing their mind at the last minute. Um, or maybe you reject a candidate and their friend is applying for another role at your company. And if they've had a bad candidate experience, they could talk to that person and be like, I'm not sure you want to apply at, 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 at iterable, you know? Um, it's the, the, the number of situations where you have those like small world moments, particularly in the tech 
uh, in the tech uh, industry is it's it's surprisingly frequent. Um, lots of people know lots of people, and word gets around. So we I want to make it so that everybody walks away from the an interview at Iterable saying, okay, I'm even if I don't get the role, that was a great experience. Or Iterable seems like a really good company. Like that's that's really important. The the third thing I would say be very very clear with your interview panel about what their focus areas are. Um, you know talked so much uh, today about competencies and values. Um, make sure that you've got those down and focus on behavioral questions. Those tell me about a time type questions. They're, they're easily the most powerful questions out there. Like the a lot of the kind of uh, super clever gotcha type questions, those really don't get you much information. It's, it's you're gathering evidence of, of, of whether they have these competencies and values. And then the final thing, is if you find the right candidate, go for it. Right now, especially, the market is so tight. If they get through the process, they're probably going to be a great fit. Um, and and like going, oh, well, we still got three people in the panel stage and a couple of people waiting to do the tech challenge. Like, And now we've got this one person who did really great on the tech challenge. Well, let's just offer them the job. The other, th the other five people, we're going to say, we're going to keep you in mind for future roles because there's definitely going to be future roles and we'd love to come back to you. Um, so that that would be the final thing that I would say. Just keep that in mind. Go for it if you find the right person. Okay. Yeah, that's great advice. Um, well, I think I am going to start wrapping us up a little bit. We're kind of nearing the end of our time. Um, yeah. But before I ask my final question, is there anything else about our topic that we haven't covered yet that you would like to add? Yeah, there there is just one. Treat your people team, your HR team, whatever you call them, treat them like gold the recruiting is such a hard job it's way harder than people think and right now it's even harder you know with the the um the great the great quitting um people leaving jobs and um, there's so much competition out there the people team the recruiting team they are they're partners in building your team so you should never treat them like some kind of auxiliary or administrative function so that's that's the one other thing that i want to say there yeah, that's a great point. They are your best friends in this process. They really are. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so now for the final question. Uh, it's one of my favorite ones. In general, what advice do you have for up and coming support leaders? Uh, yes. I was looking forward to this question um, because I know that pretty much throughout our conversation today, we haven't even gotten to anything beyond when someone says yes to an offer. Um, but th there are a few things that, that I do always try to keep top of mind. The first is be vulnerable, be authentic, be humble. You know, I, I think it's so important to be able to admit mistakes publicly in front of your team, to be able to say sorry. I think a lot of particularly new managers, they they think like they have to have all the answers. They don't. Their job is to support the team to get the right answers. That's really the the, the key there. Um, and it it can be it can be a difficult step for uh, new managers to take to kind of expose that level of vulnerability. But the benefits in terms of building relationships with your team is it's far greater than people realize so you know that that's definitely the first thing the the second thing is delegate a company can't grow and you as a person as a leader you can't grow without being really good about delegating and i i think i was in a management training a few years ago and somebody quoted a couple of studies, I think, that showed that delegation is one of the biggest, I think actually the biggest factor in terms of employee retention. Like if an employee is delegated to, if they're empowered, if they're given responsibility to do other things, that drives growth. Um, and it allows you to focus on you know, the bigger things and building your next generation of leaders. Um, the, the reality is that your team member's success is your success. It's not the other way around. So really kind of giving them the, the opportunity to, to grow and be successful uh, is, is super important. So delegation, very, very important. And then the final thing, we talked just a little bit 
about this as well is always be talking about career development. For for us, it's in every single one on one. Um, that's a whole other topic. You know, always have great one on ones. Don't reschedule one on ones. Make sure that you're always talking about how they're doing and how they're feeling about the role, how they're feeling about the company, how they're feeling about their manager, um, all all of that. But always have career conversations in every single one on one. Um, make sure that you know what they want from their careers and then do everything in your power to get them there. Make sure they have individual development plans. And once you've got an IDP, make sure that you revisit it on a fairly regular basis. It shouldn't just sit there and get get proverbially dusty. Um, I, I know that I've got people on my team who are more interested in the customer side of the business. And then I've got some people who are more interested in the technical side of the business. So the folks interested in the customer side, like, Maybe someday they want to be a customer success manager and move away from kind of the support piece. The technical folks, maybe someday they want to be a software engineer. That's two entirely different outcomes for two people who are in the same role right now. And so it's important for me and my managers to know exactly that that level of detail for every single person on the team. Um, and then when I'm doing headcount planning and figuring out what the next year is going to look like, I can have a pretty good idea about where where I want people to go and so that we satisfy the needs of business, but also satisfy the needs of the employee as well. Ah, I'm starting to see why you have so much success with promoting all of those internal people to <laughs> higher roles. <laughs> Sounds like there's lots of yeah. good thought and structure um, behind tried, career yeah. development. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, cool, Neil. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with me today. This was really enlightening, uh, I think, will be super helpful for other support and CX leaders. I hope so, yeah. <laughs> um, before I let you go, if anyone watching or listening wants to contact you or learn more from you, what's a good way for them to do that? Um, a couple of ways. Just uh, you, if you Google me, if you Google Neil Smith Iterable, first hit will be my LinkedIn profile. I, I double checked yesterday and, <laughs> and it is. Um, so you can reach me through there. Um, also, I'm on the support-driven Slack community as well. Um, so that's that's proved to be a really awesome resource. So you can find me there as well. I'm always happy to talk to other support leaders, and um, uh, you know, and if anyone's in the San Francisco Bay Area, uh, particularly San Francisco or the North Bay, let, let's go get coffee sometime. 